I would like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to today's focus passage, which is Psalm 95. If you'd like to follow along in your own Bible or device or pew Bible, or if you'd simply like to listen as I read these words, Psalm 95 is our focus passage for today. Come, let's sing out loud to the Lord. Let's raise a joyful shout to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before him with thanks. Let's shout songs of joy to him. The Lord is a great God, the great king over all other gods. The earth's depths are in his hands. The mountain's heights belong to him. The sea which he made is his, along with the dry ground which his own hands formed. Come, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep in his hands. If only you would listen to his voice right now. Don't harden your hearts like you did at Meribah, like you did when you were at Massah in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and scrutinized me, even though they had already seen my acts. For 40 years, I despised that generation. I said, these people have twisted hearts. They don't know my ways. So in anger, I said, they will never enter my place of rest. Fandom is a strange reality. I've been asked multiple times today, why are you wearing an orange tie? For the record, it's salmon, <laughs> which shouldn't offend any of you. But the question is, why are you not wearing your red and black tie? After all, we participate in a strange cultural ritual known as college football and other kinds of fandoms. For a lot of you, that's sports, but it may be something like a comic con or a civic club or a professional network. There's some kind of organization that you gather with in the assembly to take part of and to find your meaning, to find out more about yourself and others, to find a home, to get your bearings. The similarities between, between sports fandom and organized religion are striking, one psychologist says. Consider the vocabulary associated with both. Faith, devotion, worship, ritual, dedication, sacrifice, commitment, spirit, prayer, suffering, festival, and celebration. It's a lot of similarities, isn't it? Now, in a previous life, I might have encouraged you or made you feel guilty about the kind of time and effort and energy you put into cheering on your particular team. But, but I'm not doing that today. No, you, you go ahead, paint your face, wear your colors, go out to the game or experience the game from the comfort of your own home with family. Be a part of the community of fans surrounding your particular sports team. Bet the house on your team this weekend. No, don't do that, actually. That was a pastor is not to encourage that from the pulpit. Do not do what I just said. But you get the idea. There is nothing wrong with being a big sports fan. Slick Hawk, the Seattle Seahawks super fan, says, we're all one voice. It's a powerful thing. It's tangible. Larry Stone in the Seattle Times says that virtually every study shows the sense of goodwill, bonding, and shared purpose that comes with being a fan has a ripple effect that can benefit all aspects of living. We gather with others around a central purpose and in no subtle way to proclaim our loyalties in no, no subtle way to proclaim our priorities, in no subtle way to proclaim our values. We gather with others voluntarily because there are things in this world that are bigger than ourselves individually. Once again, it might be sports, it might be another voluntary 
gathering, but it says something about you and what you're seeking. This Cultivate series that we have begun at First Baptist Church are, are introducing multiple elements of what makes good fertile soil for spiritual growth, not just in your individual spiritual life, but as a church body. What are the ingredients? What do we need to be churning up together in order to be a healthy body of Christ? The first aspect that we introduce today is that of congregational worship. What we gain from gathering here in this assembly or gathering through our digital worship experience or gathering with the saints through our radio ministry, what are we saying when we take part in such an assembly? What are we hoping to gain are the questions that we will ask today. In Psalm 95, we read of an enthronement psalm. It is ascribed to a king. And in earlier psalms, it may have been talking about the earthly king, King David. But in this case, it is no doubt that Psalm 95 is ascribing worth to God on high. Human leaders will fall. Even kings, the mightiest kings, will fall. But the divine king will never fail, is how this psalm begins. It is central to the identity of God's people to proclaim this in a gathering space with, with purpose, to proclaim that God is one. Psalm 95 is not a mere acknowledgement of God's existence, but a public witness of lordship. God is over all. God is over the kings of the earth. God is over the other gods that we look to. God formed the earth itself with his hands. And so the psalmist says, therefore, we must kneel. We must bow before him. And so the acknowledgement of God's presence and the public witness that we give it's more than just a, a verbal acknowledgement or one in our minds. Our very postures, what we do with our bodies, speak of something. Bow before God, kneel before God. The psalmist implies that in this assembly and in this worship, also a response should be made. The psalmist says, do not harden your hearts. As you have done before, I will confess I noticed as well that the psalm ended on a bit of a sour note, didn't it? I think what the psalmist was saying is we've been down the path before where we don't take our worship seriously. We've been down that path before where we do not receive God's word and we suffer from it. The psalmist says, do not harden your hearts. Receive the word of the Lord, respond in faith, pursue the heart of God in this space. In today's reading and throughout the scriptures, there are countless regular testimonies of God's people gathering, if not weekly, regularly and corporately and intentionally. They are saying something by their voluntary gathering. It's not mere cultural ritual or meaningless routine because where you spend your time and what you do with it and who you spend your time with says something about you. And it says something about your priorities. And it says something about our collective virtues. And so in the same way, for congregational worship, for that critical ingredient in the fertile soil, we gather to celebrate God's goodness and salvation regularly and with intentionality. We gather to proclaim the values of God's kingdom in this place, that we would speak those words to each other, that we would receive those words and carry them with us. And that would be transformed as we prepare to go from this place. As the ancient Jews gathered at various festivals throughout the year, Christians made a bold statement in naming Sunday the Lord's Day. 
they made a bold statement that every time this Sunday morning rolls around, we would remember and celebrate the empty tomb. That when we arise on Sunday morning, as the sun comes up, we would remember that first Easter morning in the garden when Jesus emerges from the tomb. Since the time of the early church, we don't always know every worship practice from really early on, but we have learned that there was some kind of a regular time set aside on Sundays to celebrate the onset of the new creation. I'll repeat, we, we gather with others because there are things in this world bigger than ourselves. With that in mind then, how much more important is this gathering that we call congregational worship? Once a week, we gather to say to each other and to our community, Jesus is Lord, the tomb is empty, and Christ is making all things new. We gather every week to proclaim those truths loudly and boldly, simply by being present with one another. In this series on Cultivate, talking about the fertile soil of First Baptist Church, these next few weeks we'll talk about congregational worship. We'll also talk about the need to be transformed in community. We'll talk about the need to be engaged missionally and to use our hands and feet to share Christ with our community. And we'll also talk about the importance of each one of us investing in the work of this church. Worship in and of itself is not isolated apart from these other elements of the soil. They are mixed together, churned together. There is much overlap and they grow together, they work together. So it's not just congregational worship. We are also in this place together to be transformed as a community. The late Professor Marva Dawn said, God's revelation conveyed in worship through our hymns and through sermons and responsive readings. It unmasks our illusions about ourselves. It exposes our pride, our individualism, our self-centeredness, and in short, our sin. But worship also offers forgiveness and healing, transformation, motivation, and the courage to work in the world for God's justice and peace. We gather because the Spirit moves in and among us, in this assembly, we reinforce the truths of Scripture. We ascribe worth to God. We are formed and we make some sense of this world. We hear the stories of Scripture. We practice the gospel. We voice our desires. We share virtues and we live them out together. In congregational worship, we are transformed in this community. But worship is not only something that has implications in this hour or in this place. Worship is indeed mission. Worship provides the church possible modes of having a, a positive influence in society by what the church does and says week and week out. When we gather in this place regularly and routinely and we hear words spoken and sung of, of love, and compassion, and grace, and mercy. When we hear that time and time again in this space, it should transform us. We can have faith that the Spirit will move in and among us. Worship is also an investment. I will give that to you. I'm still telling folks about how last year when we were completely shut down and just a few of us were coming in here on uh, Thursday evening to record worship, just a handful of us, and then we would put it out uh, on Sunday morning. I said, <laughs> I get it. I get it. I, I really enjoy sitting here in my pajamas watching me preach too. That is exactly... <laughs> and I said, it's going to take some work to get back into the rhythm and routine of gathering again for worship. So yes, 
It is an investment to be here today. It is an investment to tune in online to experience this worship. If you are out of town on Sunday, yes, it is an investment then to come back on Tuesday and say, you know what, I'm going to take part in worship at First Baptist Church because I can go to our website or Facebook page and pull it up and participate in the same way. It takes energy. It takes time. It's a true investment, but it is worthwhile. In the same way, and I say this with admiration and respect and fun, in the same way that you would not miss a Georgia Bulldogs football game, or in the same way that you would not miss a Georgia Tech football game, other teams, I can't go down the entire list, but we'll stop there. Whatever your team is, in the same way that you would not miss that event, I prayerfully encourage you to make congregational worship a priority. The first church I pastored met in a gym. We had to walk past a bunch of weight equipment to get to our worship space inside a a large fitness room that we would set up on Sunday mornings. And every Sunday, I would have to walk past a sign that said, a one-hour workout is 4% of your day. You are out of excuses. I had all kinds of excuses. I didn't appreciate that. I had so many excuses not to use 4% of my day to work out. And you can imagine, every week as I walked past that sign, I couldn't help it. I said, what about church? What about congregational worship? A one-hour worship service is 0.5% of your week. And yeah, I'll go ahead and say it, you're out of excuses. Whenever I go to the doctor for a routine checkup, every time he or she asks, have you been moving? Have you been exercising? And usually after I get past my humming and hawing and saying, I don't, I'm busy, I've got two girls, I'm a pastor, I'm a, says, we're not asking you to do two-hour workout every day. You may not be able to do a one-hour workout a day, But if you could get out and walk for 30 minutes a day, or if you could do a 15-minute workout in front of the TV, you've got to do that. It's part of being healthy. You can't just sit around all day and expect to be healthy and to live a fruitful life. You've got to do something. You don't have to do CrossFit, but you've got to stay active. Like exercise or diet or study or professional development, worship is essential to who we are as people of faith. Worship is essential to who we are, and so we gather in this space regularly with intent to shout our praise to God, to hear the truths of Scripture, to grow into a likeness of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would make that a regular part of your lives. In October, we'll dive a little deeper into a series on worship and talk about the things that we do in this space, why we pray together, why we sing together, why we take of Lord's Supper together, why we hear the Scripture proclaimed together, and I hope that you will be present for that. But in the meantime, as you seek to cultivate the soil of your spiritual life and the spiritual soil of First Baptist Church, I invite you to keep it up or to take your next step to regularly gather in this space at 11 o'clock or our 845 banquet hall service to pull up our digital worship service that is available 24 hours a day. Plan to be changed by congregational worship. Plan to hear the voice of God when we gather together plan to become more and more like Jesus the more and more we hear about his love and grace and mercy together. The body of Christ is worthy of your time and worthy of your energy. The body of Christ needs you as part of our healthy soil. 
I invite you to continue to cultivate your spiritual life. Let's pray that God will give us the strength to be regularly committed to congregational worship here at First Baptist Church. Let's pray together. Lord, we acknowledge today that worshiping together is a joyful challenge. We know that when we are together and we hear your word and we sing together and we pray together, when we acknowledge your presence in our lives and give thanks for all of the blessings in our lives, it is a joyous event. But we also acknowledge that it is a marathon. It is something we are called to regularly do. Lord, when we are weak or when we are tired, give us the strength to make congregational worship a regular part of our lives. Whether it's in our early service or our 11 o'clock service here at First Baptist Church, if it means pulling up to our kitchen table, opening our website, and joining in worship that way, if it means tuning in on the radio because we can't physically be present here today, Lord, give us the strength and help us to realize the importance of gathering with other followers of Christ as we seek to become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.